Cray. Hello, all you hardcore boxing fans out there. How are you doing? It's Porky here, the voice of hardcore boxing. Uh, I'm joined today by Terry, my good pal from London. How are you doing, Terry? How are you doing, Big P? You didn't introduce yourself as Big P this time. Didn't I? Uh, it's, just, it's Big P here, the voice of hardcore boxing. I don't know. I've gone back to being uh, you know. Porky. You know. <laughs> you know, don't you? You know. It's been a long day. Uh, are you keeping all right? Oh, man, man, I can't complain, you know. I get to get get to catch up with you again, so, you know, it's always are a blessing. You, are you tier-free down there, Terry? Because we are up here at this uh, moment. No, so we're tier two, which is households can't mix and all that. Oh, yeah. But, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's sticky. That's the only way to describe it. it. It's a nightmare. So what, what's ended up happening, Russ, actually, is, so say you want to meet your mates. You're all basically having to go half an hour outside of London to have a few beers. But because the pub is shut at 10, you can just come back anywhere on the train. Yeah. it's uh... So what's the difference between showing pubs at 10 or, or 11? I don't get that. No, I don't either. Maybe, you know, maybe COVID is not really a nighttime thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe it just goes to bed. I don't know, mate. I have no idea. Yeah. It's, it's a mess. I think we can all agree. Anyone listening to this is, it's been managed in a really bad way. It's a mess. No one seems to know what the hell they're doing. And the longer this goes on, because we can't have Christmas like this. As a country, Britain will never tolerate being told you can't have more than six people in your house. No way. Yeah, it's madness. Uh, right, well, we'll, we'll go straight. We'll jump straight in. There's been a lot going on, as always. Uh, British Boxing Board of Control are happy with Terry O'Connor's explanation for his scorecards on two of the fights, the Vasquez Ritson, Thomas Asomba, and uh, the other kid, Tommy Ward. And it wasn't a mobile phone that were in his hand. Uh, what do you think to that, Terry? Um, so the annoying thing is they should have to publish the adjudications, I think. And they should have to publish what Terry O'Connor said. And we should have a chance to review this because I can't understand what Terry O'Connor was doing because he wasn't even looking at the fight. The, my worry is you're not looking at the fight. And let's say he only looked at that phone for a second. He's probably lost three or four seconds of action. And that can be the difference between someone winning a round and losing a round. Yeah. yeah. But, but let, let's, let's, let, let's strip it down, Russ. And let's talk about what really happens here. Once you're in on that gravy train, the worst thing that Robert Smith can do is alienate anyone on that gravy train because they could talk and they could go public and reveal what really goes on behind the scenes. Mm. And that would bring the board down. I think we all know that. So Terry O'Connor had to be seen to be disciplined, but they couldn't punish him. Do you see what I mean? So it was, they call them sham trials, don't they? Where it's like, yeah, he's going to get his comeuppance. And then it turns out that actually he was never going to get his comeuppance. So I think that's where Robert Smith is. But we also need to just remember how, how much contempt Robert Smith had for the fans in that interview he gave on IFL. I well, thought the it one was on Sunday case. morning at 8 o'clock? 7.52, but yeah, I know what you mean, Russ. <laughs> well, didn't he admit that they got back to uh hotel at, like, in early hours, in it, and then... They yeah. Were... Look... It was just unprofessional. I, yeah. You know, you know, if Riku was here, he'd tell you because right, Riku's, you know, the guy who knows about comms. But when you're in charge of an organization, you can't come out and disrespect your customers. Like you just can't yeah. because customers have a long memory. And when you need them the most, they'll remember the contempt you have for them. So I just think it's been badly handled overall. Someone needs to tell us what was in his hand and we need to see the evidence. Produce the thing Terry O'Connor had in his hand. Let us see if that is actually an electronic scoring device or not. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. I, I have no dreams of holding a board license, to be honest with you. It doesn't really interest me. Boxing, boxing is a very small sport full of a lot of clowns. So I have no real interest in it. But what I do have an interest in is exposing the, the dirt that happens behind the scenes that costs fighters their careers in some cases. Mm -hmm. Because, Russ, let's zero in on Thomas Asomba for a second. Mm. 
Hey, we both met Thomas team. Asombra and spent time with him, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah, you, you met him through Jaffa, right? I met him through Jaffa, yeah. I was sat in the back of a car with him at 100 mile an hour through Attercliffe and he kept looking at me and I kept looking at him thinking we're going to die. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, fuck it, fuck it. I've been in an E class with you, mate. I didn't know if I was going to live or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want to get in one with Phil Jeffries? He's worst driver in North East. <laughs> but yeah. Thomas, Thomas fought out of his skin. And a he win did, for Thomas yeah. Sombra in that fight catapults him. And remember, how many weight classes he moved up? 150, 118, 122? That's insane. Yeah. And so for him to not be able to move forward because Terry O'Connor has been told protect the money fighter because that's what he does. If you look at Terry O'Connor's scorecards, Porky, and I know you've done the analysis. Mm. When it comes down to fights where there's no consequence, right? Just like filler. His scorecards are normally pretty good. They're in line with everyone else. When there's a money man, like uh, if you think about what they were going to do with Ritson, I think we spoke about this before. Mm. Ritson's lined up to fight Josh Taylor right now. As things stand, Ritson's lined up to fight Josh Taylor. So that's a money fight. Um, that Thomas Ward, they're lining up as well for a European or a world title. Those guys couldn't lose that night because that's all the investment money down the toilet. And so I'm sure O'Connor just got a little, a little elbow to the rib saying, look, you know, there's a lot of money on these guys, you know, just, you know, judge them fairly. Uh, do you know what, how I look at it, right? I just think that there's a lot of MTK fighters getting a lot of very close decisions. Now, Ira Davis got one at your call against Vasquez, didn't he? And he's an MTK fighter. I don't know if uh, people feel that they have to side with the big promotional outfits, maybe. But I feel that it were playing as it were playing for everybody to see that Tommy Ward got bashed up, didn't he? And Lewis Britson got outboxed, even though we were forcing the fight, he was outboxed. But we went over us. What do you mean he was forcing the fight though? It was Britson just we were coming just forward. forward. What is, I mean, well, no, it's, well isn't that he's just what, walking what, forward. Kind of, sorry, go on. Then. But that's just walking forward. I'd understand it. If he was coming forward and throwing heavy leather, and go, okay, you're like, oh my God, this guy's he's really taking it to Vasquez. Well, that's what I meant, not... Terry, didn't I, technically? You're the trainer, yeah. I'm not. I meant he was coming forward. You know, like Ricky Hatton used to bomb forward. Yeah, but there was end product with Hatton. And Russ, listen, yeah. man, you could have easily been a trainer. I mean, if Chris Medley can do it, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you know, you're trying to get me in trouble with Chris, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh man I think that uh, Lewis Ritson's a lovely kid and I've watched it with Muton Jaffa says watch it with Muton well I have and I've watched it with with sound on and I thought he got beat but it doesn't mean to say that he ain't a great fighter or he can't win a world title Some of the, sometimes these depth, things bro. happen don't they no no he's out of his depth he's like, like Ritson's got the power, right? But it doesn't look like he knows how to apply it. And this happens to a lot of British boxers, actually. If you look at a lot of British boxers, they've either got really good power or a really good chin, and they never quite figure out how to do it properly. Like, and I know, I know I'm going to go against my instincts here, but at least with Carl Froch, you saw in his career, he slowly learned how to, how to apply what he had. Yeah. And you saw the improvements in him. He, he grew and he evolved. Um, and that was good. And incidentally, I can't believe, like, you know, Fro I'm almost tempted to say, why isn't Froch going in the Hall of Fame? People are telling me Tim Bradley over Carl Froch. I think Dan Raphael said that. But I was like, no, 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 no. Froch over Bradley, easily. I don't know. Everybody said he were nailed on, didn't they? Gareth A. Davis said he were nailed on. He's on selection committee and and he don't, he don't seem to be happening, does he? I don't know if he's rubbed a few people up the wrong way. I uh, tell you what, it, it's a hard intake though, because who's going in this year, Paul? Mayweather goes in. Ward goes in. Yeah. Uh, who else? Tony. James Tony's got to go in as well. 
so you start to look at that list and you go, Jesus. But I think, I'm going to be honest with you, I think Carl Froch deserves to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. But I don't know who you leave out in, in response. But he definitely does for his record. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought he'd have been a first ballot for all the world champions, former, current and future he's been. And, and you know, he's got four world title belts, British belt outright. He's done everything asked of him, hasn't he? Beat everybody except Andre Ward that he's fought. You'd have thought he'd be up there, wouldn't you? I mean, I'd at last 30 years, him and Lennox Lewis have beat more world champions than anybody from this country. But I don't know if it isn't to be this year. I think you're getting eventually. But Clinton Woods never seems to get a mention, does he? Look, look at that era. Clinton Woods, uh, seven-year fighting world champions from James Tony to Cloud. Seven year in that era, hanging with them guys, Glenn Johnson, and you know, people like that, Tarver, and... craziness, isn't it? Yeah, it's messed up, it's messed up. But, uh, getting back to Ritson and Terry O'Connor and Vasquez and Thomas Asomba, what do you think has happened with the board? Do you think they've just said, right, uh you're not guilty, or do you think they've actually looked at some evidence? I mean, did they actually have a meeting in Cardiff for it done on Zoom? Are we going to see any correspondence? And are fans right to say that Robert Smith were pompous and arrogant that Sunday morning? I think I think the board got it wrong. And you know the board got it wrong when Hearn's doing an interview after the fight saying, I need to have a word with the board. Because he doesn't do that. It's the first time you've seen Hearn really lose his composure. And maybe it's because he was able to watch it from home, like the rest of us, for a change. I don't know. But that's the first time I've seen Hearn actively cross that barrier between promoter and governing body and say, I'm going to go and have a word with the board. And, you know, for him to, be able to, for him to say, my fighter lost, is a, it's a pretty big statement for us. And so... Yeah. I think we need to take that for what it is. And as much as they might, may want to walk back from it now, Terry O'Connor had an absolute shocker. It was, it was an absolute car crash. His scorecards were an absolute car crash. And I am confident when he judges next, and he'll be judging soon, don't worry, Robert Smith will make sure of it. Mm. You'll see a lot of 115, 113 scorecards from Terry O'Connor. So yeah, we can't ask safe. any questions. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's... Uh... I don't know, not many people have seen this. I'm going to put this on channel now. Let me just show you. This is my pal. This is my pal, Frank Smith. He he, he, uh, he got a 10 with Peter Fury. Now, we were at Dennis's show ringside. He come and sat behind us. He said, how's it going, Porky? Where's your big chain? I went, fuck off you. You rip Yui Fury off against Parker. <laughs> and... Uh, I know sometimes I can be a bit harsh if I've had some of that or I've had a drink or something, but <laughs> I knew he were a fucking wrong and then. And he, and, he, and and I thought, well, he hadn't fucked off. He was sat behind me. It was right uncomfortable it was, but there was nowhere else for him to sit. <laughs> but uh, sometimes I've got no filter, have I, Terry? But I, I look at some of his scorecards and I've gone through his record he, and he's, he's had a lot of money out of boxing, hasn't he, Terry O'Connor? He's had thousands of yeah. pounds, hundreds of thousands. He's been all over the world and that, but what scores stick in my mind? Uh, John McDermott, Fury. That tends to stick in my mind. There's there's other ones as well, isn't there? Is, did he do the uh, the recent one, Gorman and Latte? Did he score that? I think he did, didn't he? Well, I mean, no, it wouldn't surprise me. I I haven't. Checked. I might be wrong on that, but I'm sure he scored that, and I think I'm I'm sure that. He gave it as a, a 100 points to 90, 10, uh, uh, 10 rounds to nil. But a lot of people had Latte getting, you know, two or three rounds out that. It wasn't just a clean sweep. Do you know what I mean? It weren't, it weren't that kind of fight. But I, I just think he's let his send down on, on, a, on a... Well, they all have, aren't they, really? Ian John Lewis has, hasn't he? Victor Laughlin. My, Michael Alexander seems to go under radar, doesn't he, on that? That Vasquez Ritson card. Do you think he had it two rounds to Ritson? Do you think he uh, he's got off light? He he has, 
And, and here's the problem. It's the same in most sports. You can never drag the officials up to justify their scores. And it's not good enough to say, well, that's just my opinion. It's like, no, no. What is it you saw that meant Ritson won this fight? I'm trying to understand it. And you can't tell me because he walked forward. Because yeah. we can all walk forward, man. It's not rocket science. So what is it he was doing? Was he controlling the territory? No. Was he controlling the pace of the fight? No. Was he even controlling the psychology of the fight? No. Vasquez went in there and it was like a, it was a workmanlike performance for us. Vasquez literally went in there, got his, came out, got his money. He did what he had to do to win. And because of that, we should be giving him credit. Instead, that's the second time he's been jobbed on a, on a British show. It's not a great advert for people to come over and fight. Yeah, it's, I don't think it's good at all. And Thomas is somber. You've got to feel for him, haven't you? Because he fought his heart out, didn't he, Thomas? Yeah, he gave up a lot, Russ. He gave up a lot in weight, yeah. in height, and all that. And he still showed that skills pay the bills. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Uh, all right, then, moving on. Uh Apologies. We've had a lot of apologies in recent recently. Uh, starting off, Johnny Nelson apologised, saying that Povetkin's... He said Povetkin's punch were lucky against Dylan White. He came out and apologised. And he's now come out and apologised again uh, regarding Terry O'Connor. So has Coogan. Uh, so has Eddie Earn. They've apologised for the for their comments. Uh, they've also Coogan and Eddie have also said, "Oh, Terry O'Connor's a great guy. He weren't caught with a phone. Uh, it was a scorecard." Adam Smith's come out defending Terry O'Connor. He's a great guy. He's known him twenty seven year, and Robert Smith does a fantastic job at the board. And Spencer Fearon put something out about. Uh, Joe Gallagher's video having a little pop at Sky Spencer. He seems to be doing that a lot lately. And he's apologized to Eddie Earn. And Joe Gallagher's just apologized on seconds out to Sky for his comments about Jonas and not getting the fights. Uh, do you feel that sometimes people see say things in the heat of the moment and then wake up the next day and think, oh, what have I done here? Because they know that the sport's controlled from the top to the bottom. For example, Border Control, Sky, and then the promoters. Do you feel that the little people like the boxers and the trainers sometimes say stuff from managers and then regret it? Well, clearly, just from what you've said, yeah, there have been a lot of regrets. Even, even if the apologies aren't heartfelt, I think the message is clear. You can't just say what you think. Everyone has to stick to the script. Like me. That's how... <laughs> I don't know, Russ. Man. You know, you can be a company man when you need to. You what? Do me a favour. Hey, you know, there's certain fighters you've never criticised, Russ. Like Froch. One and another. Legend, isn't it? How can you criticise a record like that? Come on. Nah. You nah. can't criticise a guy with a record like that, can you? Nah, he got lucky. He got lucky, didn't he? Well... <laughs> The only thing I can criticise Carl for is he's a bit frugal. <laughs> no, he's a lovely kid if you get to know him. He's a bit dry, but he's lovely. But no, but I text I, him I, every so often. Eh? I text him every so often. Yeah, good man. No, I just feel that... 079... No, 07973... Dot, 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 dot. <laughs> oh, you're causing trouble for me. Uh, <laughs> no, I just feel that... Isn't it funny how people change? For example, Spencer Fearon used to walk around, didn't he, with a sky badge on his coat. Do you remember when we seen him at them shows? And he was walking yeah. around with Sky Sports badge on his suit. And now he's... Okay. Eh? Okay, so let's break down where we are right now, Russ. We're, we're in a boxing market that's probably 20% of the size it was this time last year, right? Yeah but you've got the same number of people in the sport. So you've got more, you got more mouths trying to eat less food. Yeah. And so people are getting pissed off. People are getting antsy. People are getting agitated. 
sometimes you feel you're not loved, so you you throw your toys out the pram. A lot of stuff's happening because there's not enough money going around to keep everyone quiet, like the old days. Yeah. And so you're seeing that with Joe Gallagher because when when there was money in boxing, Gallagher could afford to to get soft touches for his fighters. Mm -hmm. But now now we're saying, well, there's no money for that, Joe. And now he's upset because he can't get what he wants. Um, I have it on good authority that the Billy Joe Callum Smith fight was it was possible, right? And Gallagher was like, no, nah, no, nah, we're not doing that. And we're definitely not doing it for for the money you're offering us. We want silly money for that fight. And so that 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 dies a death. And then he wouldn't let Jonas fight unless she fought Terry Harper in a rematch. And you're like, well, just just keep Tasha Jonas active. I really like Tasha Jonas. And I'd one of the handful of female boxers I'd happily watch over and over again. So it's a shame that he's ruining their careers. But to go on TV and say that, you know, Jonas is being overlooked because I don't know if he said Sky or Matchy Moraes. I thought that was just out of order. I think as someone who's experienced real racism and real discrimination, you have to be really, really careful when you throw that term. He about. meant equality, he said. He said he meant he, he just wanted to be paid equality to men. And he said he's not media trained. So, look, it looks to me like his arseholes fell out and he's come out and he's backtracked, hasn't he? But he's also yeah. got Beefy Smith and Callum threatening to retire at end of the year. So he's under a lot of pressure. Callum Johnson's not getting any younger. He's, is he 36 shortly? Or I don't know, he's mid-34, yeah. is he? Yeah. Uh, I thought, no, you'd have to check that, Terry, on your phone. He might be coming up 36, him. I'm not sure. Hardcore's check that. Well, Callum's knocking on now, isn't he? Callum Johnson. Uh, was he 26 when he won a gold medal in 2010? I don't know. Oh, if you... poor I mean, let's just double check how old this guy is. Yeah, well. Mate, he's 35. Jesus. So he's coming up 36 then, so all right, one on. He did win a gold as well in 2010, didn't he, Commonwealth? Yeah, he's 36 next year. And he signed with Nazim Ahmed, didn't he? Jesus. So he, he, he's got to get a move on, hasn't he? What is he, 18 and 1? Yeah, look at Porky with the stats. I haven't got no stats in front of me. I know the record's off by heart. Look, the po point I want to make is he's just down the road here, 35 mile away at Lincoln. But the point I want to make is he's a massive puncher. And I remember when he sparred Carl Froch years ago and Carl Froch gave him a, a black eye. And Carl said to me that he could he could dig and he would a big big unit and, and that he'd do well. But he's been inactive, hasn't he? I know he's had some personal problems. His dad passing away and things like that. But... Uh, He's inactive, but it didn't bother him when they jumped in with Baturbia, did it? He, get, he got stuck in. But Yeah, then he fought Shawnee Monaghan as well. Yeah. And do you feel that he's not had Robert Green, Callum Johnson? I mean, why can't they put him in with Callum Smith and make an in-house fight? Well, here's the problem with some guys, Russ. We've talked about this before, right? Yeah. That you, you I call it the middle management trap. So like in every organization, you end up with a group of people who aren't good enough to, to lead the company, but they're too valuable to let go to a rival. So you end up paying them a silly amount of money to do not that much work. Yeah. And then when you start making redundancies, they're the first people you get rid of because they're too expensive. And I think Callum Johnson's in that kind of category, a bit like Dave Allen, actually, where they're six-figure fighters now, but there's no real world title upside on them. So you're literally just paying them to fill a card. And so yeah. if you're her and you're like, why am I going to pay 120 grand for a Callum Johnson fight when I could get Joshua Bartzi in for less than that? Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Or I could get this other, which other kid he's got. But you can get these guys in for less and the fans won't really care either way. Do you see what I mean? So he's caught in that trap. Of, do I really need him? What do I need Callum Johnson for? Yeah, but you can understand Joe Gallagher being a bit frustrated, can't you, when he's seen other people get certain fights. I mean, I know he's had a few digs at Dave Allen uh, getting looked after. and But there's other people in queue as well, isn't there? Huey doesn't seem to be getting any dates, does he? Uh, Beefy Smith's not getting dates. Uh, Martin J. Ward. John Ryder's they're saying he's getting one, aren't they? An eliminator. Right. But let's stop, Russ. Who are you going to put Beefy in with? Well, I'd put him in with Kel Brook, me. I'd throw Kel Brook at bone. 
Yeah, but Kel's got a dance partner in Crawford. Yeah, we know that, don't we? But he's, that uh, that's only really been finalised in the last three or four weeks. They could have made that fight, couldn't they? Kel Brook against Beefy at 154. He could okay, bring but... Frank Warren up and get the Liam Williams one on at 160, couldn't he? And have a trilogy. Because they were close fights, weren't they? With Liam Williams and, and, and yeah. Beefy. He could, he could yeah, have so... up and put that on. Yeah, so I think my point is, there's no real dance partner for Liam that would justify the money that Liam would have to earn. Yeah. And and so with a John Ryder, for example, there is. Put him in with Callum Smith. Yeah. That could co-feature a pay-per-view. That would easily justify his status as a co-feature in a pay-per-view. And then you look at Callum Johnson. Like, who are you going to put him in with? Watsi? Is Watsi ready for that? Craig Richards is tied up. So now you're struggling for an opponent for Callum Johnson. You know, do you put him in with Bivol? Maybe, but Jesus, to be a massacre. And so, yeah, so I think my, my point when it comes to Gallagher is his guys are too expensive in the current climate because they're not pay-per-view stars, but they're not prospects on the way up. They're just too expensive to put on shows now. They're in middle, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, so he's basically come out and uh, apologised. Adam Smith's uh, hanging out at the back of Robert Smith and Terry O'Connor. Coogan and Eddie were there as well. Johnny Nelson. Well, we know we know what uh, we know what Johnny Nelson and the Johnny Nelson's about. I'm just gonna somebody's give me some here. I'm just gonna where am I? Have I got it here? I always make a point to. In fact, I'll save that for another video. I've got some. I've got some proper Johnny Nelson material for, for later on this week. I'm going to surprise a few people. Johnny Nelson predictions and comments, but uh, jo Johnny's come out. I keep seeing Dave Colwell on, on loads of channels and that. He's, I mean, it, it must be awful for Dave now. He's having to work with Frank Warren. And after, do, do you know what I mean? It must really choke him. And could you imagine them two in the same room? <laughs> God. Well, Frank must have a little wry smile to his face. Do you know what I mean? Now, do you know what, Paul? You and I talk about this, like, yeah. obviously off, off air. We talk a lot. We just go, that's boxing. People yeah, that who you boxing, think are really yeah. enemies aren't really enemies at all. No. I know. It's just that I, I, I could, I'm from a different mould to a lot of these people. My dad were a coal miner and, you know, I've been involved in motor trade and, and other, other things as well. And, and it's a bit like with scrap metal. If you've got a... Uh, Dennis will tell you this. You know, when you shake on somebody's hand with scrap metal business, that's a done deal. But in boxing, it doesn't seem to be. If you backstab somebody in scrap metal business, that's it. They won't work with you again. But in boxing, they'll they'll stab you back one Monday and then on Tuesday, want to be pal again. But, but I, Russ, I have a problem. Remember, remember what we said. This yeah. sport isn't big enough to sustain multiple factions, right? Yeah, no, yeah. There's only a certain number of people who can generate money. So you've just got to get yourself close to that. And I sometimes mean, that means working with people you don't necessarily like. Ultra Tech. I want, everybody needs to go watch Ultra Tech Sports Raw's video tonight on Kel Brook's situation. Now, he, Eddie Earn said, he said he, he won't work with Kel Brook again, right? Well, Kel's coming to the end of his career and all that. And he can't work with somebody that slagged him off. But yeah, Amir Khan slagged him off loads of times and dug him out for years, but then he went and signed Amir Khan. Tyson Fury digs Eddie out all the time. But if Tyson said he wanted to go with Eddie, Eddie had sign him. So why would he not want to do it to Kel? Kel Brooks done nothing wrong. He didn't have a contract with Eddie Earn. And if the, if the, if it's true, and I don't think it is, I've heard Eddie Earn did know what was going on. If it's true that Kel's gone to bot see Bob Aaron with his dad to make that fight, well, why not? He's not got a contract to Eddie and Eddie wasn't doing anything for him. He's not done anything legally or, or even morally wrong because if you want to start talking about morals, I mean, we could wipe floor with Eddie and like a dishcloth, going on about drug testing in boxing and crying when that uh, American guy died on his show on the Saturday night, but uh, uh, sorry, on the Sunday after he died. On the Tuesday, we're making fights with drug uh, convicted drug cheats. 
So he and he put Kel Brook in with Golovkin as well. So he don't need to be speaking about morals. He sat in sauna with Lee Purdy. No, Barry Earn sat in sauna with Lee Purdy and Brock rules, didn't he? Before Devin Alexander fight. And Eddie were tweeting about it, bragging about it. So he can't talk about morals, can he? Uh, so the Kel Brook thing's a mess, right? Yeah. Like you, you, That's what you've I want got to your... touch on, yeah. You, you've got your contacts in Sheffield, as have I. And we both know that Kel doesn't necessarily move in the most intelligent way. But Kel's not the sharpest tool in the box. So I've known, I've known Kel since 03. Like, you know, just from training in the same gym. And Since you were free? He, since 03. 03, oh, oh yeah. So, yeah, because yeah, you used to train up there, didn't you? Yeah. And so... I look at him and I go, he was never the sharpest tool back then, but he's yeah. always been a talented kid. And so you end up going, okay, so what went wrong with him? And he was a guy who never believed in himself. He never believed he deserved to be that good. Mm-hmm. And so he never lived like someone who was destined for greatness, but his talent meant that he was destined for greatness. And he's paid the price for that on numerous occasions. Think glasses are full with him, Terry. Uh... I think he's half cut, mate, if I'm being honest with you. It's, and it's over for him now. Mm, no, no, because he's still, a, he's still a big name. And if we really break it down, Russ, he hasn't sustained that much damage. Like, Kel's not a guy that's been in, like, 15 wars because he's got a pretty padded record. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. So he's probably got two or three fights where he can cash out. But I don't know where he goes after Crawford. Like, if Crawford does a number on him, like a real beatdown. I don't know what he does. But Kel, Kel hasn't lived how someone of his talent should have lived in his peak years, and he's paying the price for it. But you and I also talk about this, Russ. Mm. Hearn dropped the ball when Kel won that world title. Eddie should have been on that microphone saying, we want, we want to unify with Floyd, all of the belts. Right? That's what should have been happening immediately. And I think that would have been enough to stop Kel dicking around in Tenerife. But if you look, his career has been rudderless. Now, I don't know who made the call for Jojo Dan. I don't know who made the call for Kevin Bizier, Frankie Gavin, all of those pointless fights that Kel had. But he killed his earning potential. Frankie and Gavin were pay-per-view. Bargain. What bargain that was. But so for me, I think... Kel's got a right to say Hearn mismanaged my career. Well, not mismanaged, but Hearn didn't provide the same platform that he gave other people. Maybe Eddie was still learning back then. I don't know. But it was Kel's world title win coupled with Fotch Grove's two porky. That meant Eddie could sign that first big contract with Sky in 2015. Remember when he got that exclusive deal? Yeah. It was those fights that did it for him. So Kel's a big part of Eddie Hearn and Matchroom. I think yeah. Eddie owed it to him to plan out his farewell and say, yeah, like you did fights... Yeah, what fights do you want to finish on? Let's make these things happen now. Instead, Hell you, I think Hell he... you as well. Yeah, he looked after the people who were there from day one, and Kel was one of those guys. He never looked after Kel. He was second signing one. It wasn't it Audley, Darren Barker, Kel Brook, Frotch all signed in the close to close. Yeah. All with the same year, didn't they? Yeah, and so they, they, they. The pro, one of the challenges I think there was actually, Pork, was Kel always wanted that Khan fight. Khan never wanted that Kel Brook fight. Never. That fight was never going to happen. Anyone that knew Amir Khan knew that fight was never going to happen. Mm. And him, Khan going to match him was the ultimate slap in the face because he joined the promotional label and then refused to fight Kel. Because we all act like Khan was there out of the goodness of his heart. He was there because Hearn said, look, we don't need you making noise about what happened with your wife. We're going to give you a three-fight deal, and you can decide who you want to fight, where you want to fight, and we'll just find a way to make it profitable for you. Because which one of Amir Khan's fights do you think turned over a profit, Russ? None of them. No. Those three fights on Matchroom were, were loss-making. So why would you have had them? 
unless you were trying to pay off Amir Khan. Yeah. I think Eddie Yearn thought he were going to get Amir Khan Kel Brook done, didn't he? So you were looking at it like speculate to accumulate, you think? No, no, I think they paid it to keep Khan quiet because remember, that was just after um, Khan's wife and Joshua were linked together. Do you think so, yeah? It, otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Amir Khan would have told Eddie from the start, I'm not fighting Kel Brook. Because he said it from day one, I'm not fighting Kel Brook. Well, he hasn't, has he? And I've actually met Amir quite a few, a few several times, actually, in Bolton when I've been with Peter Fury. And he's always been all right. He's a gentleman. Uh, uh, yeah. I never asked him about his wife or anything like that. I did see the thing in paper, but I never believed all that, me. I didn't believe any of it, of it so I don't know. Well, no one stood. No one, no one did, no. There you go. Yeah, that's strange, that, isn't it? Somebody accusing... You're going with a partner or something like that, and uh, but anyway, uh, w do you see Calbrook beating Crawford? Nah, nah, no, 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 yeah, do you feel that uh, Eddie's comments about uh, Kel not treating Dominic Ingle right with money and all this, and you know, with this with this fight he's having, you think that was justified? I think it happens in everyone's career. Why? What was Eddie like this when Golovkin got rid of Abel Sanchez? I don't think he was that vocal, was he? No, he never said a word, did he? Strange, that. You think it's cost yeah. Eddie's a jilted bride at the moment and he's not got uh, got any input with his fight? Because I think deep down Eddie would have loved to have got one over on a pound for pound king, wouldn't he? Because the, we all say there's five... Before Loma got beat at weekend, there were five guys who nobody could pick who were best, weren't there? Usyk, Edel Spence, Crawford, Lomachenko and Canelo. I know you pick Canelo, don't you, but... They were, they're yeah. everybody's top five, weren't they, last week? And yeah. you were telling me that Eddie Earn were interested in a British guy who's had nine years fighting one of them five. Because he's got Del Boy fighting Usyk. He's had Rocky Fielding fighting Canelo. He's had Kel fight Errol Spence. Uh, uh, so you, do you mean to tell me that Eddie... And he's had Lenart, not Lenart, he's had Crawler in with Lomachenko no, did, no, sorry, Crawler didn't fight Lomachenko, did he? Oh, he did, didn't he? Yeah, he got that, that right hook to the head. Luke Campbell fought him as well. So the fifth pay-per-view star in the whole of boxing, we've got a matchroom fighter fighting him. And you were telling me Eddie didn't want no to do with that fight. I think, like I was told earlier on today, that there were no money in pot anyway, but Eddie's turned it around and said to make a statement to everybody, Kel Brook weren't loyal. He went behind me back. This is what happens when you do it. I drop people and Sky aren't interested. But I heard Sky never had the money anyway. This is why I believe what I've been told. And, you know, so. Yeah. Oh, OK. So, Russ, where you would think where, there's some where, credence in that? Well, where would Sky get the money? So, if, if we look at Kel Brook, yeah. Kel Brook's a guy that needs to fight on pay per view if he's fighting a big name. Yeah. And, and, and Sky and Matchroom don't have the, the kind of cash flow for that. No. But a broadcaster that would would be ESPN, who are backed by Disney, right? Yeah. So so Bob can put a deal together for Kell Brook versus Terence Crawford. And I think Hearn was upset because I don't think Hearn could have matched it for the reason you just said. Sky don't have the money. Mm. So, so Kell's like, well, okay, if Sky don't have the money, Eddie, we're just going to go and do this on their platform because we need to get that money. Because Kel's got two or three fights in him. That's why I'm not I, that's why he's probably not paying Dominic 10% because he's like, well, this is the last bit of money I'm ever gonna earn. I need to I need to sort myself out. Mm. So I can understand that. Yeah. You think that's why Dominic weren't offered a lot of money and then he spun it round and said they want enough time to train him. But we were already on the wait anyway. So the last six weeks of a camp, if you're on weight, it's just a case of 
you know, tuning up in it and all that. Well, you know about all that, don't you? But yeah, sharpening up and that. I, I, I think it, it's saving money. I think Eddie was worried that if Sky had bought the, the rights, Bob Aaron would have just rubbed his face in it. It's an ego thing. Can you imagine Bob on IFL just going, yeah, look, you know, Eddie says all this, but look, we managed to get ourselves on Sky. If we can do it for Kel, we can do it for all of our other guys. You know, it starts to look bad politically. Yeah, and this is what happens when you give somebody an exclusive deal, do you think? I mean, you mean you mean to tell me Adam Smith, the big boxing fan, couldn't get this on Sky? And what about Johnny Nelson, Kel's boy, who fetched him up from Jim at age 10 or to age 9? Johnny Nelson, why weren't he helping Kel out in all this? Right hand man at Sky. And why why didn't he have a say in all this? Or did he just, you know, not fight Kel's corner? I mean, what, what happened to him? Company man. You know what I mean? Hey, 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 everyone's got bills to pay with us. Yeah, I know exactly. Well, Johnny, last time I seen Johnny, we were driving an 18 plate Black Range over. So I don't think his bills. A problem for him flying high at the sky, are they? Uh, we covered all that there. Yeah. Oh, Connor. Uh, yeah, sorry, just a wreck thing. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, we've done all the apologies. We'll move on to the next lot here. Uh, Len, uh, Love, Christopher Lovejoy, 19 and 0. 17 knock it's 19 and 0, 19 knockouts, 17 in first round. He's done 22 rounds altogether. He's boxed for 44 minutes as a pro. He's 25 stone, six foot five. Let me repeat that: 25 stone and six foot five. 347 pounds. So that's what he says he is this week. Now he's fought in bars in Tijuana. Now I've, I've obviously you know that, don't you? Because you'll have seen his box rec record. How's he got into the WBA top fifteen? Because he's four 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 on box rec. So how can the Bible have him at four hundred and forty four? WBA in at fifteen. We've now got Dave Allen saying he's going to gate crash the world scene. As Dave booked the trend of going through the levels, or is it just? promoting and social media and how the sport's going at the moment because there's a lot of boxers being quite vocal at the moment. They're wondering now if, if it's worth going through levels when you can just do what Dave's done. What do you think about this? If Dave beats him, he, well, the saying he's going to fight Char. Well, Dave's just said on here, on uh, boxing social, he's going to fight Char for WBA regular. What do you think? Okay, so let's look at the, let's look at the chess move that's happened here, right? Yeah, you got you got a kid in Dave Allen, and Dave is whatever he's he's popular and he's visible and people know who he is, but he's unproven. Whatever people want to say, he's unproven past a certain level. But you need to make your money off Dave Allen because otherwise you won't get rid of him, or you don't yeah. want Frank to have him. And remember what we said before, Dave Allen's become very expensive to have on a card all of a sudden. Yeah. So how, how do you get money out of Dave? You get him into the governing body where you have the best relationship, which is the WBA. Yeah. But can you imagine what we would have said if Mendoza had put him in at 15? We'd have lost our minds, right? Yeah. So he's got to beat somebody who's ranked 15 to get in there. So they, fe so they fetch him over. A guy with a, a, a record that looks brilliant to the casuals, 19 and 0, 19 knockouts, 17 in first round. But when you scratch the surface, he's only been in a ring for 44 minutes in no amateur experience. And he's 37 oh. year old, 25 stone. It, it's basically a pudding of a guy that they're going to feed to Dave, isn't it? Well, so yeah, so if we, if we look at it, the clever thing Hearn did is get him the ranking. Yeah. So when Dave takes the ranking off him, you can't blame Eddie Hearn. He can just deny and go, well, no, the governing body made him 15, not me. Don't blame me because Dave Allen's now ranked. And then all of a sudden, you start to see Dave being talked about in the same breath as Trevor Bryan and Manuel Char. Look, don't be surprised if Dave fights Shannon Briggs, for God's sake. Do you see what I mean? That's the sort of scenario we've got to start looking at, Russ. Yeah, but that'd be a dangerous fight for Dave, wouldn't it, that? 
well, they're pretty, yeah, pretty similar styles. Both hard headed, both with with left hooks. Yeah, why not? But well, my argument with this though, Terry, is Matchroom said that said to Yui Fury's team that Sky were refusing Christopher Lovejoy for Yui because they want Yui to be in a proper fight, but yet he's ranked number fifteen in world. But there's no footage of Christopher Lovejoy fighting on YouTube. There ain't any footage of him fighting. All we've got is a guy turning up who's blown everybody away in 19 and 19 fights, 19 and 17 in first round. That's that's Gerald McClellan, better than Gerald McClellan, Golovkin, Wilder, Ernie Shavers, George Foreman. That's better than all them. He might he might be better than all of them. Well, we don't know, do we? But yeah, I have a funny know. feeling that this is going to be the biggest patsy ever and that it could be nails in coffin for boxing for the sake of getting a few quid in. I don't... No, not really. No, no the, the fans will lap all this up. Lovejoy's been... He's been a breath of fresh air, actually, coming to the UK. I wish more boxers were like him, actually, Russ, if I'm being honest with you. Yeah. I've really enjoyed having him over. He may not be in the best shape, he may not be the best boxer, but you can sit and watch him talk all day, though. That's one thing I do like about him. And all he needs to do is get Dave Doubt himself. Yeah. You know, maybe yeah. maybe stick a few jabs in there. You know, just stick a few jabs and then just see what happens. But I think Dave stops him with a body shot, to be honest with you. Dave will take him out inside three rounds. He'll be licking his chops now at this right right now. He'll be licking his chops and he'll, he'll bowl him over because he's pretty crude, Dave, isn't he? But if he turns up in right frame of mind, he'll knock him out and that'll be it. That'll be it last year. So you might end up, the, the Eddie might even recycle him then for Tom Little and, uh, you know, this Lovejoy guy. But we did say we wanted to see Dave fight somebody on his level and who knows he might be on the same level. I thought Amor were a bit too much for Dave and I think Dave knew that as well. But uh, my you argument... Are. You are. Maybe this was the plan all along. Maybe yeah, Christian probably. Hammer wasn't the plan. Yeah. But this is how I look at it. I haven't got a problem with Dave Allen fighting Lovejoy because Dave's never won so much as an area belt. The problem I have is Lovejoy having the ranking. And it goes back to this, uh, Billy Joe Saunders, Martin Murray. I don't have a problem with that fight. Martin should have had a world title years ago. He's a world title challenger. Billy is a two-time champion, but they've both been inactive. So, Martin Murray against Saunders isn't a problem for me. The problem is there's a world title on the line and Martin Murray was slipped in rankings last month, but he hadn't had a fight this year. That's the problem. When, when was his last fight, Russ? Oh, we had a fight this year. I don't know. I have a look on my phone. I don't know. I spoke about this with Rico, but Martin Murray, uh, can you have a look on yours, Terry? I mean, you know, you know, I'm not his biggest fan, Russ. You're making me suffer here. I don't think Mark. I think Martin Murray fought last autumn. He's had he's had a couple of wins, has he, since he lost against Undam. But uh, Martin Murray shouldn't have been slipped in the rankings last month if he's not fought this year. It's so so wrong. I mean, I'm not even sure if that uh, goes against the WB, WBO's rules. But he's been slipped in at number 12, so that means Billy can fight him as a voluntary. This pudding Dave Allen's fighting has been slipped in at 15. Dave beats him then, then sits on the ranking. It's wrong. It's wrong how, how you know about it. Do you know what? It's a pretty clever move, actually. I've just realised what they've done with this one. But what? When was the last time Martin Murray fought? November last year. So Martin Murray's not fought for 13 months when he fights Billy. But yet he's just been slipped in the rankings in the top yeah, 15. But, uh, so yeah, now he gets a you know title it, shot. So I, I'm willing to bet any money, Russ, that Martin Murray's on a good purse for this fight. And he'll be paying a very healthy advisory fee to his advisors, is what I imagine is the case in this one. So pretty good bit of business by the company that advises both men in the fight. Yeah, I see what you mean. We can see where it's going, can't we? Yeah. 
But uh, I don't agree with it. But take the belt away. I think it's a decent fight because they're both inactive a year, aren't they? They've both been out at ring a year and both been inactive. Yeah. So why not? But the belt shouldn't be on the line. Same as the ranking for Dave Allen Lovejoy shouldn't be on the line. It's just... It oh, rankles but, me. But, Russ, here's the thing. These belts and these rankings are irrelevant now. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. That, no. that, that's where boxing's headed. Boxing's headed to, I want to see this guy against that guy. Don't care if this belt is irrelevant to me. I just want to see these guys fight each other now. All right, then moving on. Uh, David A has had some beef with Dylan White. Is that because he wants to fight him or because he wants to make sure that Chisora and Dylan White fight a third time, whether they lose or win in the next fight? He just wants a pay-per-view uh, in February, March. What do you think, think to that? I, I, you know what? We know David likes to write scripts, don't we? I don't even think it's that, Russ. I think those two have had needle for a while. Yeah. Remember, years ago they sparred, right? And ever since then, I think Dillian's view was eventually I'll be able to beat David. Like he ain't all that. That that was what I remember years ago. It's probably like a decade ago, Russ. Yeah. And like Dillian was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's nothing special there. Was his view. So I can see that there's always been a almost like a rivalry, like a I don't rate him that highly. And I think the same is true from David. But David's like, I don't rate him that highly. So whenever they speak about each other, it's just a little bit of needle. The difference is David can keep it quiet when he needs to. And Dillian isn't necessarily like that. Dillian will just say what he thinks at the time. So I think it's just a little bit of needle, but you get this in boxing all the time. I don't think it means they dislike each other. I think it's just, if you say something about me, I want to respond. That's all there is to it. Yeah. 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 All right, then. Uh, moving on. Uh... But, no, no, but, but, but to your point, though, if, if Chisora and Dillian both lose, that's the next logical fight for them, right? It's that trilogy. And yeah. then Povetkin and Usyk will fight each other. There you, there you go. You've already got your double header for the next pay-per-view. Well, if Dillian wins and Chisora loses, would they fight then? No. I don't see that happening, no. Would I, I not... think... Oh. Yeah, I think you just put Usyk in with like a Dillian. Yeah, would Dave Allen fight Chisora? And did, they could write a script, couldn't they, saying that Dave Allen were a double agent uh, helping Usyk prepare for Chisora? <laughs> Yeah, what look, the crazy thing about boxing is, Russ, anything's possible. Yeah. All right, then moving on. Uh, I want to finish with the predictions for the weekend. Chisora Usek, Savannah Marshall ranking, and Dave Allen uh, against Lovejoy. I've got Dave Allen to knock Lovejoy out in an accumulator. Usek to knock Chisora out, Savannah to knock Rankin out. Do you agree? Uh, so I think Usyk stops Chisora. But I think Chisora gets stopped on his feet. Uh, I think he just... Usyk will grind him down with pace. The thing people can't live with with Usyk is, is that pace that he, he sets. And I don't think Derek will be any different. I think he'll succumb to the pace and he'll just get stopped on his feet. I think Savannah Marshall... Like, there's this pedigree, and I like Hannah Rankin. I think Hannah Rankin's a lovely woman. I think she's been brave as hell in taking up boxing as late as she did, and she's done really, really well. But Savannah Marshall, Savannah Marshall. Like, Savannah Marshall is female boxing, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And I don't know if the two-minute rounds were enough to do the damage you need to stop Hannah Rankin, but I don't know if I'd want to be taking 10 rounds of punishment from Savannah Marshall. Male or female, if I'm being honest with you. Listen, I've known Savannah oh, a few years now, and she punches really, really hard, really hard. Honestly, she she spars men, and she, she'll smash her to bits on a ranking. It's that's a nailed on KO. That the Dave Allen one should be a nailed on one. The Usyk Chisora one. If Del Boy turns up and Usek fights like he did against Chaz Witherspoon, that could go to points for Usek and that could knack me bet up, couldn't it? 
I don't think Usyk is going to let that happen. I think Usyk knows this is it's showtime. Yeah, I think he knows he's got to turn it on, doesn't he? Yeah. Uh, my last question is, uh, you know that Saunders is fighting Murray for WBO. A Coley yeah. is fighting somebody, I forgot his name, it's a very hard name to pronounce, for Cruiserweight WBO. And they're saying Usyk's going to beat Chisora and he'll be screaming for mandatory WBO. Do you think that Eddie Hearn's getting a bit of a bit of power with WBO and he might be trying to keep him sweet so he could keep Usyk at bay for another year before that mandatory fit WBO? What do you think? I, know, I think he's just manoeuvred it really intelligently for a little while, hasn't he? So, yeah. so Billy Joe was always a WBO guy. Mm -hmm. O'Coley has been looking for a world title for about a year now. And I know they haven't spoken to him. So I think this one makes sense. I can't even remember who he's fighting. He's fighting a Polish guy. I can't remember who it is. So sorry, sorry. You know, I know the YouTube comments are going to laugh about this, but sorry, guys. Is it something um, Naki or Skaki or something like that? And it could glow Aki or something. I don't know. I couldn't pronounce it. it yeah, it could be Glovacki. Yeah, it could yeah, be something him. Something like that, yeah. And then, does that mean he's got pull? Because Usyk will then be mandatory for the WBO? Well, no, no, pensioning the... fees flying all over the place for WBO in an era where we've got no fucking money. There's no boxing money. They're all on less money, but yet they wanted to give these governing bodies sanctioning fees. I mean, what's it coming to? You'd think they'd just tell them to jog on, wouldn't you, in the middle of the pandemic? More money for fighters, isn't it? No, no, no. You've got to keep these guys sweet because you need them at various points because fans still buy into the idea of world titles. So there's value in keeping those relationships sweet. Yeah, it's... Uh... Exciting times ahead. This is why we love this sport so much, Johnny. Well, it's <laughs> good to have the heavyweights back in the blue ribbon division, Matt. <laughs> Rough, tough, rugged, durable, all action, compelling. Can, you know, but can I say this, Russ? What? I don't, I don't mind Adam Smith. And you know why I don't mind him, Russ? We did a charity boxing show once, right? And Adam Smith was doing the commentary for this white collar event. And Joe, you know the weird thing was, he was just as enthusiastic about a white collar event as he is for Joshua versus Klitschko. Like, I, I couldn't believe it because I did a few of the corners. So him and I were sat next to each other. And I was, I was just talking to him. I was like, mate, how do you still have this energy for a white collar show? He's like, he just said, I love the sport. And he really does. Like, he's. Yeah, he probably yeah, he, does. But he's the Dennis Nielsen of boxing. I'm not keen on him. But what I will say is, do you remember that interview he did where he, he, he was 10 year old and he got a dictaphone for Christmas and he was taking it. He took it to school and he admitted that he was walking around the playground and he were he were uh, practicing, saying, "And Larry Holmes is moving in on Witherspoon and jab, jab, jab. What a great jab Holmes has got." And he was actually practicing on his dictaphone and he, he did it. He spoke about it in a Sky interview. And I mean, most kids at that age, when I was that age, you'd probably have an Atari, wouldn't you? Or a rally grifter or something. But could you imagine sitting with your friends at school saying, what did you get for Christmas? And Adam Smith's there with his dictaphone. I, I just think he's a gimp, mate. And he, he looks like somebody that's so uncool in a cool sport. I don't know. He, he just don't fit. It don't, I know he's I like enthusiastic in that, but you are. I really like him. You are well. I, I don't. I don't like him because obviously I get to hear, hear, hear things behind the scenes and that. And I just think, I just think that Adam Smith is the Grim Reaper of boxing. In fact, I'm going to have the thumbnail for this video: Adam Smith as the Grim Reaper, and some heads on a chopping block. So I don't know whose heads I'm going to put there, but he's going to be a Grim Reaper. I don't know. I just like to have a dig at him every 24 hours. Bean! <laughs> it makes me feel better about myself having a dig at him. <laughs> Is that bad? <laughs> I was having a meal at my dinner table and I mentioned Eddie Earn on the phone to somebody and uh, my uh, one of my kids went, oh, not Eddie, Dad, again. Not Eddie again, Dad. So oh, I wow. thought, God, is it that, am I that bad? <laughs> Oh, hey, but that's what, that's what it takes to be the voice of hardcore boxing. 
You know, that's what it takes. You've got to live the dream, haven't you? I mean, look at me here. What time is it? 10.37 on a Tuesday night. I'll get this up for tomorrow dinner time now because I'm, I'm going to premiere it just so I can see all comments before it comes out, you know, in live chat. Because yeah. I, I think I'm getting to a stage now where I'm starting to like the vileness of the comments and the emails. I'm starting to read them and chuckle, whereas before, you know, I used to go bonkers, didn't I? I'd be like, oh, where do they live? But now... Yeah. I'm starting to to uh, to. I don't reply to them, but I'm starting to have a bit of a chuckle now. To, to can't to, take it personally, Ross. I don't take it personally. Do you, do you remember when you said to me? Sorry, you said to me, "Don't uh, people asking for my phone number?" And I shouldn't give it out to some people, but you do. You take people as genuine, but then they're ringing you from phone boxes at four a.m., aren't they? And shouting, <laughs> shouting, "Bean, don't phone to me to do my head in." And, I, uh, I shouldn't. Uh, I don't take it personally like I used to do because I, I'm outspoken, aren't I? But if I don't do this, right, nobody will we access, will they? Because they all want their access. Nobody's saying anything, are they? I mean, I look at these interviews and some of these kids who are doing these interviews, Rob Tebbett, for starters, <laughs> Omar, and all them sort of people. They all sort of know the boxing, don't they? But they're not. When they get these people on the hook, do you remember the, do you remember the time Umar asked Eddie Earn a question that I sent him, that I sent Coogan? I said, Coogan, get that Umar to ask Eddie this question, all right? And he knew what, he knew Coogan knew I were angry. So Rob Tebber, so, so, sorry, Umar, sorry, went to ask this question. I said, Coogan, get Umar to ask Eddie this question. He asked Eddie, he said, oh, Eddie, can I ask you this question? And Eddie went, yeah, they put camera on him. And Eddie went, who is it? Who's it off? And, and Umar were told, I've been, and I've heard back, Coogan, don't mention my name. I wasn't bothered anyway. And Umar went, oh, it's just off him, Eddie. And he went like that, went phone to him. And Eddie went, oh, yeah. Uh, blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. That, that's, that, no, 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 that ain't, what, that ain't what happened. And walked off. Point I want to make is, right, they knew not to mention my name, but Eddie just dismissed it. Now, Umar should have said, whoa, hang on a minute, Eddie, that's not an answer, shouldn't it? But they daren't, dare they? They daren't ask the questions. Do you know what I mean? And that annoys me. And Rob Tebbert sometimes does a good job, good job of asking these questions, but when he gets them tied in knots, he lets them off the hook. I can't believe it, Terry. You know, when we have our debates, and we do have some debates when we've had a drink, we don't let nah. each other off the hook, do we? Not even if nah, they're nah. there, then we're all pissed up on whiskey. Everybody says the bit, don't we? And we all agree to disagree. But, yeah, you just got to have it out. Yeah, we have it out, don't we? And Rico as well. But I just think that these people, the frightened, there's like a fear factor there, isn't there? And I'm not frightened of these people, but I'm not going to get the opportunity. And I'm over it now. But I just feel that these people should ask better questions and show that the journalists... I mean, I see it with Gareth A. Davis. They know what's going on. And they're all, they're all licking. They are monitor lizards. This week, they've been <laughs> bum-licking monitor lizards around Terry O'Connor and... And Robert Smith, but they weren't all doing that the Saturday night on the social medias. Forward to where we're at now, and look how it's changed. Look how all their attitudes have changed. Do you know what I mean? They've gone full circle, haven't they? Backtracks. Russ, Russ it's like it's like the Godfather, right? You gotta have the five families sat around the table and it's no use one of the families, the Genovese is kicking off, right? Because they all sit there and go, listen, you kicking off is bad for all of our business. So you need to pipe down, you need to make peace, and we can go back to making money. And I think that's what Robert Smith said to everyone. He said, guys, we're all getting a bit emotional about one scorecard. The big picture here is we're all getting paid. Yeah. And you're all getting that favorable treatment. You're getting the title shots you want. You're getting the judges you want. Yeah. So how about everyone just shuts up and accepts that we're all in it together? And I what have a feeling that we're going right. to What you've just said there is right. It reminds me of when Johnny Sack went to see Carmine at Sopranos. He wanted Ralph Cifarello clipped. 
And he went, well, we can't do that. This is millions of dollars at stake. <laughs> do you remember? <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it's so true. Yeah. It's, you know, yeah. as fans, we, we react in the moment, right? As boxing fans, we're like, ah, oh, man, that was rubbish. That was corrupt. It's this, it's that. Yeah. But we, we overlook the times the corruption's worked in our favor. We overlook the times when the dodgy judging's got Carl Froch to win against Andre Durrell and stuff like that. Come off, man. He it, stuck the arena out. Yeah, but he was the best display of defensive boxing you'll ever see. Carl couldn't land a glove on him. Of course he did. I can show you photos of Carl clipping him. Nah. But you, you, you see what I mean? It. It, it, it sometimes works in your favour. It sometimes works against you. Fair. So no one ever calls corruption when it goes in their favour. So it's worth remembering that there's a bigger ecosystem here and one bad judging performance isn't going to kill this gravy train. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose you're right, Terry. I suppose you're right, mate. I suppose you're right. All right, then. Well, listen, it's been a pleasure having you on. As always. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll bid you farewell. All the best. Have a good day at work tomorrow, Terry. You too, Porky. See well, mate, and don't have nightmares. Don't you have nightmares, Nick, in my one-liners. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll see you. All right, mate. Take, Take care, pal. Bye. Bye. Uh, that was Terry from London. Uh, he's got a really good job, Terry. He went to Sheffield University, so good luck to him. Uh, I'm going to get a quick shower. I want to watch a film now. Angels with Dirty Faces, made in 1938. James Cagney plays a character called Rocky Sullivan. I've seen it before, but sometimes you just feel like watching a film you've seen before because I spent half my life surfing on that. But I'm going to watch something that I know it's a nice film. I like it. It's an old black and white one, but I want to get a shower now. Uh, I think that's about it, really. Uh, I'm not going to put this video out tonight, but I'm going to premiere it for tomorrow, 12 o'clock. All right, so I've got a lot on tomorrow, so I'm not going to be doing a video tomorrow. So I've done it now. I've got it out of the way. Um, I've got other things to do tomorrow. So, all right. So I hope you enjoy this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe it. Leave a nice comment. If you don't leave a nice comment and you leave a vile one, Cameron will block you. That's just how it is, I'm afraid. But I don't block anybody on here because I don't know how to do it. <laughs> but I hope, you enjoy, I hope you enjoyed the video. We like to keep giving opinion on here. If anybody's offended, fuck you. How's about that? No, I don't mean that. Anybody gets offended on it, it's boxing. We all get emotional over it, don't we? It's an emotional sport. But we all want what's best for boxing, don't we? But I still feel that all these sanctioning bodies, and even boxing by the control, they all need a good shake-up, don't they? But it is what it is, isn't it? All right. Peace out. Keep on trucking. Shout out to AJ Innovation Alloys. Oi! Get in bed! <laughs>